Good morning. Well, I'm glad to be back in the Gospel of Matthew again. Uh, Lord willing, we'll be um, going through Matthew at least until the end of summer. And today we're going to be in Matthew chapter 12 again, um, from verses 43 to 45. Throughout the course of the last three chapters in our study of the Gospel of Matthew, uh, Jesus encountered a tremendous amount of opposition primarily by the religious leaders of his day. These were men who were very respected and very popular and who lived what looked like impeccably clean lives. But Jesus said that they were like whitewashed tombs, clean on the outside, but inside they had dead men's bones, and even that they were controlled by the devil. You see, I think that... um, and to our modern ears, especially if you've read the Bible and, uh, and you see the description of the Pharisees, that you can sort of look at them as, uh, if someone's called a Pharisee, that's an epithet. That's, uh, you're calling them something bad, all right? But in the first century, in Israel, the Pharisees were very, very well liked by the people. They were very popular. As a matter of fact, after A.D. 70, when the Romans came in and destroyed the temple and destroyed the whole nation, really, the only sect, the only religious Jewish sect that survived in Israel was the Pharisees. The Sadducees were no longer needed because they were people who worked in the temple and there was no more temple. And the Essenes died off because they were ascetics and they didn't eat food, okay? They starved and they died. The only people who were left who were religious were the Pharisees. And even today's modern religious Jewish people are actually based off of Pharisaical Judaism. Okay? So these people who are the opposers of Jesus to the common man, they looked at the Pharisees as people who were to be emulated. They were well-liked and they were outwardly very moral people. They were people who um, were the teachers. They would be the kind of the, we'd call them maybe the Saturday school teachers, all right, at synagogue, and, and lots of people liked them. But their problem was that their religion was only outward. It was not inward. It was not something that was true and living inside of their hearts. They only outwardly conformed to the law. And so, from our passage today in Matthew chapter 12, verses 43 to 45, Jesus describes what his generation was like, and it is not a pretty picture. Once we dig into this passage, I I think we'll see that it has some great applications for us today as well. Let's pray. Oh Lord, as we always pray when we open up the Word and worship you, that you would Open our hearts and open our eyes to see your word and to believe it. Speak to us now, Lord. Help us to see that even as uh, Christ's generation was like a person who demons had gone out of but then came back with full force, that in some ways our generation is at least as bad. And we need you. We need your grace in our lives. Help us to not be like the people whom Jesus is describing in our passage Please dwell within us. Help us not to have empty souls, but fill our soul with you. And be with this church, Lord, and help this church to be one that always seeks after you and wants to serve you and follow you as the number one person in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Matthew 12, starting at verse 43. When the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places, seeking rest, but finds none. Then it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds the house empty and swept clean and put in order. Then it goes and brings with it seven other spirits, more evil than itself. And they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that person is worse than the first. So also will it be with this evil generation. 
Now, these verses might strike modern 21st century American ears pretty strangely the first time we hear them. After all, the, the spiritual world has been almost entirely relegated to the place of ancient mythology by the modern scientific man, right? If you were to have a conversation with a stranger and bring up the possibility of, say, an unclean spirit inhabiting a person, they would probably think you were mentally ill, right? Am I wrong about that? <laughs> no. We don't even have categories for what Jesus is saying here in America in the 21st century. Um, however, the Bible is very clear about the presence of demonic and angelic activity in the world. In fact, the direct reason in our chapter of the opposition of the scribes and Pharisees is because Jesus cured a man of demon oppression. Just read a few verses before, in verse 22. And they subsequently ascribed his miraculous work to what? Demons. All right? So they had an acknowledgement of the spiritual realm. They had an acknowledgement of demonic activity in people and around in the world. It's just we don't have those categories anymore. So I just want to say as an ancillary point here that um, the truths that the Bible proclaims are perennial and permanent, and the Bible is true regardless of what ancient man or modern man thinks to the contrary. Okay. The Bible is true. Doesn't matter if we don't have categories in science to describe demonic activity. That really actually doesn't matter. Um, as a matter of fact, I think that that leaves the modern man even more susceptible to those sorts of attacks because they are unwilling to actually um, do what is needed to address them. You see, just denying it. It's, uh, it would be like a person who has cancer. It's very obvious they have cancer. They have some kind of cancerous growth growing out of the side of their head. And they go to the doctor, and the doctor says, Oh, no, you don't need any cancer treatment. Just put a Band-Aid on it. Well, that doesn't really actually address the problem, does it? And uh, I think in, in our generation, by denying the fact that there is a spiritual world, um, we're actually worse off than those who acknowledge the fact of that. But nevertheless, very well. So Jesus here describes what happens when an unclean spirit goes out of a person. Now, most commentators believe that Jesus is not actually giving a detailed explanation of demonic possession and exorcism, but rather he's telling a sort of parable which is describing his generation. Otherwise, it would seem that these verses are somewhat out of place right here because in the verses right before, he tells them that he's going to give them the sign of Jonah, which of course refers to his death and resurrection just as Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days and then Jesus is in the heart of the earth and he comes out and rises from the dead. And then he says that um, someone greater than Jonah is here and someone even greater than Solomon is here. And then directly following that, is when he talks about this demonic activity, when a demon comes out of a person and their house, he's talking about their dwelling, their body, their house is cleaned, swept clean, made empty, and a demon goes out into desert places. Um, that was a, a common thought in Jesus' time, that demons dwelled in the desert and that they didn't like it. It was kind of a folksy thought that people had about that. And then it, it wouldn't like that, and so it would get all of its friends and come back and dwell in the person and find, hey, hey, hey we have a nice house, house to come back to now. And that person is now in a worse place than they were before. And he says, so it is with this evil generation. What Jesus is doing here is describing the spiritual state of his generation. Before he appeared on the scene, the people were walking in darkness. But when he came, they saw a great light. He not only literally cast demons out of people, he also taught the greatest, most life-cleansing, ethical principles ever spoken. Just read the Sermon on the Mount in, Matthew's cha in Matthew chapter 5 through 7. You know, if people would only live the Sermon on the Mount, there would be no more wars. 
There'd be no more adulteries. There'd be no more murders. There'd be no more shootings. There'd be no more of that. If they would just live the Sermon on the Mount. That's true. That really is the solution, uh, the ethical solution to all of our problems. Uh, but unfortunately, people don't listen to the Sermon on the Mount, and they don't live it, and they don't treat their neighbor as themselves, right? But that is the truth. Jesus gives these life-changing, life-cleansing ethical principles. And the people's house who, are, house, okay, who are hearing Jesus was being swept clean and put in order. But what happened with the vast majority is that their personal reformation was temporary. And they eventually ended up in a worse state than they, that they, than they were before. And so what I'd like to do for the rest of our time together is to show why that is and how this applies to us today. So these people, they see Jesus with their own eyes. Many feel joyful and excited. And they see the amazing things that Jesus is able to do. And they receive his word with joy. They might even start living a reformed life and turn from the various vices that used to ensnare them. But the warning that Jesus is giving here is that it's not enough just to feel joyful. And that Christianity is not about simply having a cleaned up life. This is such an important thing for us to understand. Christianity is not about simply having a cleaned up life, living in a moral way. That is what the world thinks Christianity is about. They think that Christianity, a person who's a Christian, means that they don't smoke and they don't drink and they, uh, you know, don't go with girls who do and they, <laughs> all right? They think that. Means that, they think that being Christian means being a moral person, following the teachings of Jesus. And that's the reason why the world grasps onto the stories that we hear sometimes of Christians falling. And they say, oh, what a Christian, this person. What a hypocrite. You see what they did? Well, that's actually not ultimately what Christianity is about. It's not about morality or following a list of rules. Christianity is, and it's not a sign of regeneration and a new birth and saving faith to simply think nice things about Jesus. Lots of people think Gandhi thought nice things about Jesus. He certainly was not a Christian. It's not enough to simply think nice things about Jesus. And just because you're coming to church doesn't make you a Christian, Keith Green said. Coming to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than going to McDonald's makes you a hamburger. Going to church doesn't mean that you're a Christian. No, Christ needs to live inside. If your house is swept clean, that's good. But what is it swept clean for? Just for more demons to come back and say, I see you've made a nice place for us to come back to. Boy, I'm going to make it even worse than before. Through either backsliding and going back into the sins that once ensnared you, and now you go back to them even worse, or through legalism, and you say, wow, you know, I'm a pretty good person now. I'm glad I started doing this church thing, because boy, I sure cleaned my life up, and I'm going to stay here now. People think more highly of me, and uh, I think I'm a pretty, pretty good person now. Either one of those states is a worse state than the person was in when they were doing whatever sin they were doing. It's actually worse. Pride is worse. What Jesus is saying is that these people are naturally under the power of the evil one. And it's not saying that every single person is possessed by a demon, okay? But every single person outside of the redeemed are slaves to sin and to the devil. And there are some people who come to this realization and really, really want to clean up their act, okay? Perhaps they're involved in some gross sin like looking at porn or getting high all the time or drinking too much or dabbling in all kinds of bad, ungodly stuff, all right? And then they say, I want to stop drinking too much. I really want to stop cheating on my wife, uh, or whatever. And because they come to see that that stuff is actually bad, and, and they want to improve their life and get rid of their demons. See, isn't that even a part of our modern vernacular? I'm wrestling with my demons. I mean, even people who aren't Christians, they'll say something like that, right? They wrestle with their demons, 
Okay, when we know what they're talking about. You know, wrestling with whatever kind of besetting sin is going on in their own life. And for one person, it's one thing, and it's, for someone else, it's something else. And so what do they do? They go to AA, or they go to counseling, or maybe they join a church, and sure enough, in time, they start to look more like a fine, upstanding citizen. But again, that's not what Christianity is about. Christianity is not the American dream. All right, I want you all to say that with me now. This is an important thing for us to know, all right, because way too often, even in evangelical circles, Christianity is confused with the American dream. All right? Being a Christian does not mean that, uh, you know, I'm simply moral and I have a middle-class nice house and I, you know, live in the suburbs. No, no, it's not that. So, I'm going to say it again. Christianity is not the American dream. All right, let's say that together. Christianity is not the American dream. No, because, you know, what's the American dream? The American dream is I get to have all I want. And I get to have a really nice house and a white picket fence and 2.5 children and blah, blah, blah. And Christianity says, for I am crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives within me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You see, those two things, actually, I would even say that Christianity is diametrically opposed to the American dream. It's actually opposed to it. The only ones who preach that Christianity is the American dream are ones who believe in the false prosperity gospel. Okay. You know, outwardly improving one's life is possible outside of saving faith in Jesus. It's absolutely possible to outwardly improve your life outside of saving faith in Jesus. That's why you see things like a former gangbanger who becomes a Muslim in prison, okay? And then they stop dealing drugs and they stay faithful to their wife. This person is obviously not a Christian. They would never claim to be a follower of Jesus, but they were certainly able to outwardly put their life in order. But you see what they've actually done there? They've replaced their bad habits with a false religion, which is even worse. Their state is even worse than they were before. They're now worshiping an idol under the guise of righteousness. They cleaned up their act, but the second state of the person is actually worse than it was before. A person might come to church because they have a sense of guilt and they start to live a cleaner life. But even that in itself is not evidence of regeneration. That's not evidence of the Holy Spirit. Listen very carefully here. Jesus did not come to make bad people good. Jesus came to make dead people live. To me, um, this misunderstanding of what Christianity is about is perhaps the most widespread, at least in the church in America. People come to church thinking that the reason that they're coming to church and they want to hear some message is about how to be a better dad or how to, you know, uh, 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 be a better husband or wife or how to overcome this or that peccadillo, or how to, you know, it's a list of how-tos so that they can live a better life. But that is not Christianity. It's not about making a bad person into a good person, or a good person into a better person. It's about the power of the Holy Spirit making a dead person into a living person. One who lived for themselves previously. One who lived for their own sinful desires now lives for Christ. And you know, these other things, like, um, you know, I don't know, good works, for instance, uh, are those things important? Yes, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Okay, that's Ephesians 2.10. Yes, is good works absolutely a part of the Christian life? Yes. Do good works 
necessarily follow saving faith in Christ? Yes, absolutely. Will a person live a better life in terms of the way that they live uh, sinfully or less sinfully if they're a Christian? Absolutely they would. Absolutely. And if a person actually is living in a more sinful way once they call themselves a Christian, then uh, there's a serious problem going on there. All right? Don't get what I'm saying wrongly. I'm not saying that good works are bad. What I'm saying is that good works do not equate to Christianity. All right? There's something which must follow faith, but they are not the, the main thing. And it's certainly not the thing which makes a person a Christian. That's what the Pharisees thought, you know. They thought that they were righteous by their good works. But Isaiah tells us that all of our good works are as filthy rags. See, though the Pharisees lived clean lives of order, they were definitely more wretched after becoming a Pharisee than they were before they were a Pharisee. All right? You think about it. Here's a young man. And he's struggling with this or that thing in the first century. And he's very smart. He's an intellectual young man. And a rabbi in his synagogue tells him, I think you would be a good candidate to follow me. And that person then, you know, starts to follow the rabbi and take up the... Uh, his mantle and, and, and walk with him and, and he starts to, you know, see just from an outward way, he starts to see that some of the ways that he was living his life were bad ways and so he really tries in the power of his own will to overcome them and he's able to outwardly do that. And then he, what happens to that person? He gains pride in doing that. Boy, I'm pretty strong. I, I, I'm able to, you know, my friends are still going over there and smoking weed. I'm not doing that anymore. And he starts to be prideful and think, yeah, I'm better than those people. They're still doing, living the way I used to live, but not anymore, not me. That was the problem with the Pharisees. That they thought that what they did actually made them right with God. But those two verses right before Ephesians 2.10 say this, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one can boast. No one can boast in their salvation. And we'll come back to this point. So look at our text again. When the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places seeking rest but finds none. And then it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds three things. It finds the house empty and swept and put in order. And then it goes and brings with it seven other spirits more evil than itself. They enter and dwell there, and the last state of the person is worse than the first. So it will be with this generation. So the sort of person that's being described in our passage might be someone who, for instance, is struggling with his addiction. They step into a church. They hear the pastor say that he's just lost three friends from high school in the last two months to heroin, which is actually true in my case. Three. I, I've lost three friends from my high school in the last two months to heroin. Five in the last six months. There is a serious, terrible <coughs> epidemic going on right here in our area. And this person comes in and they hear me, perhaps, say that. And the pastor tells them that Drugs are bad, and the person comes to see that the drugs they are addicted to are bad, and they do what it takes to stop doing it, and they go to therapy, and they wean themselves off, and they, they, they get clean, and so far, so good. I'm not saying that any of those things are bad. But they do all of this in the power of their own flesh, all right? They, this particular person I'm talking about has not trusted in Jesus Christ to take their sins away. He, they, he does not have the power of the Holy Spirit indwelling within him. He's empty, but he's swept his house clean in the power of his own strength, in the power uh, uh, of his will. But he still has this need for happiness. He still has 
the thing in his life which actually caused him to seek after drugs to cover that pain up in the first place, which, by the way, is the very thing that the drug deceivingly and temporarily gives that person, an escape, happiness. You know, when uh, I've had... Oh, I think now the count is uh, 27 or 28 kidney stones. Some of you know that. Praise God, I haven't had one in a while. And I think it's because of your prayers. But when I have a kidney stone, and I go to the ER, they give me this drug that is, uh, it's pretty crazy. It's called Dilaudid. Does anyone here know what Dilaudid is? All right. It is more powerful than morphine. All right. And I will have like the most excruciating agony. If you've never had a kidney stone, try 27 of them, and it will be, it will be like puking agony, <laughs> all right? So much pain. I'm like throwing up, and I'm laying there on the ER hospital bed begging the doctors to do something for me, and the nurse mercifully comes and sticks a needle in my arm and injects this stuff called Dilaudid in. And literally, within the course of about 10 seconds, all my pain is gone. Nothing can take away that pain except Dilaudid. But when Dilaudid goes in, listen, I, I've never, been, uh, never done heroin, uh, I've never uh, been addicted to that, but I can understand why people do it. If they have so much pain, and that's the thing that they try to mask and cover that pain up with, I understand why people do that, all right? You see, and now when I'm laying on the hospital bed and they've just given me Dilaudid like five minutes ago, I feel like I'm floating above the bed. Absolutely no problems, no pain, no nothing. As a matter of fact, if, any, if my worst enemy was sitting next to me, I would say, I love you, man. I love you. But it's fake. Is there still a kidney stone in the ureter blocking the way and actually causing my kidney to expand? Is that still actually happening inside of my body? Yes! The kidney stone didn't disappear. The problem is actually still there. As a matter of fact, the problem could be even getting worse. But outwardly, I'm like this. Everything is fine. Until two hours later, when that stuff wears off, what do I need to do then? Mask the pain again and go back to it. I understand it. I understand what goes on. The drug lies to my brain. It tells me that I'm okay, but I'm actually really not. You see, that's a good illustration of the deceitfulness of sin. So anyway, these people, they, they turn away from the drug because they see it's bad to something that's more, say, acceptable in the church, like uh, gluttony. They replace what was going on, that thing that um, was masking their pain, and they replace it with something far more acceptable in the church, with overeating, all right? And gluttony replaces the drug. Now food is the thing that they believe will satisfy their innermost desires. This person is actually worse off now than before because they're still in religious circles. They're feeling justified, but the reality is that they are still sitting on the throne of their heart instead of Christ. They're actually sitting on the throne of their heart. Previously, they were worshiping themselves outside of the church, but now they're religious, and they have security in their religiosity, but truly, nothing has actually changed with them. They're still worshiping themselves. They're still their own God, even while they go to church. That is a very, very dangerous place to be. I've told you all many times, the worst position that a person can ever be in is a person that thinks that they're right with God, that thinks that they're justified, that thinks that they're a Christian when they're actually not. One who misunderstands who Jesus Christ is and what he came to do. 
One who thinks that the purpose of Christ's coming was simply to make them a better person. And they stay in church and they sit in church and they hear the sermon and they become inoculated to the gospel. Inoculated to it. They get some gospel in their arm and they say, this doesn't affect me anymore. See, I already know all that. I know about Jesus. I know he died on the cross. I believe that. I believe this. Whatever, whatever. And the purpose of me coming here is because I feel like I'm a better person because I do. That person is in a very, very dangerous position. I would rather they know that they're actually not a Christian. And they come here. And they, I would rather, you know, I got to just tell you, I was preaching at a, a church in Barrington uh, like nine, nine months ago or so. And while I was preaching, I told the people, I said, if you are not in Christ, if Christ does not dwell inside of you, you are utterly lost, totally wicked. Every aspect of your life is sinful. And a young man got up in the middle of the service and he shouted at me, this is stupid! Who, how dare you say these things about me? And he got up and he walked out of the service in front of everybody. It was pretty amazing, actually. <laughs> I think I said something from the pulpit like, I love you. And then, after the service, that uh, young man came back in and walked up to me in the aisle while I was talking to somebody else. I have to say, I, I was, my heart rate did increase a little bit. Because <laughs> I, I was thinking, like, this kid's going to, went to his gun, he's going to shoot me, you know? I don't know. I don't know what, what, because that had never happened to me before, where somebody gets up and screams at me in the, in the service, you know? Feel free if you like to do that. You can, um, <laughs> And he said to me, you said that atheists are fools. And I said, well, um, you know, I didn't say it. King David said it, right? He said, where? Where did he say that? And I opened up to Psalm 14, verse 1. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. And I showed him. And I said, my name is David. I stuck out my hand to shake his hand, and he said, my name is Fool. <laughs> and he shook my hand. <laughs> and I said to him, well, at least you're consistent. I mean, that's nice to meet you, Fool. And you know, though, I would really rather have a kid like that. Because he's angry. You know why he's angry? Because he's actually listening to what the text is saying. He's hearing it. It's affecting. It's doing something to him. I don't like this. I don't want to hear this. I want to hear that I'm a nice person. I want to hear that I'm good. I want to hear that I'm smart. I want to hear that I'm good looking. I want to hear that all my dreams are going to come true. Tell me that, pastor. If you don't tell me that, I'm going to be very angry. I will never tell you those things. That's not my job. My job is to tell you the truth. truth is that every one of us inside is rotten. The truth is that no matter how much we clean up and sweep up our lives, if the Holy Spirit doesn't come in and replace what is really missing inside of us, we will end up in a worse place than we were before. It's dangerous to have a misunderstanding about the gospel. It's a dangerous place to be. You know, I, as I was writing this sermon, I was just thinking about different situations. I, I just wrote down an, a number of them um, you know, because I, I think a person might be sitting here and, and thinking, um, well, all right, I haven't done any drugs in my whole life. Why do you keep talking about drugs? Hmm? This doesn't actually apply to me. I don't have a demon, okay? So why do you keep talking about demons? This doesn't actually apply to me. Well, this it, it applies to everyone, actually. It applies to everyone. Maybe there's a person who has a marriage where they feel like their needs aren't being fulfilled, that they're not getting the love that they need. And so they 
decide to have an affair or to look at porn. And they eventually become addicted to it and they have a conviction then, some point that they have this conviction that these things are wrong. And then in the power of their flesh, they deny the addiction. They sweep their house clean. They break off the affair. They throw away their computer. But the pain is still there. And it's still getting stronger and stronger. You see, when we sweep our house in the power of the flesh, that is a sure guarantee that those desires are going to come back with enormous force. The power of the flesh is only effective as a sort of dam. All right? Like the Hoover Dam. The desire is still there. The pain is still there. But now I've cleaned house and of the very thing, the only thing that was a temporary relief of that pain. And so what will happen is that the pain will build and build and build and build. And then I deny it and deny it and deny it in my own strength until BAM! The dam breaks and everything explodes. And the temptation comes back with a fury along with all sorts of other things. I still have the need, I still have the pain, I still have the void, because the house is empty. Look at this, it says, when the demon comes back, it finds the house empty and swept and put in order. That is the key to really understanding what's needed here. The house is empty after the demon leaves. It's empty. What needs to happen? Something else, someone else needs to come in and take up residency inside. That's what needs to happen, you see. Jesus says in a passage, just a, a few passages before this one, that in order to plunder the strong man's house, someone needs to tie up the strong man. Then he can plunder his house. And not just plunder his house, but live there. The devil is the strong man, you see. Every single person is under the power of the devil. Christ is the stronger man. He has to come in, bind up the strong man, kick him out, and say, don't, don't you ever come back in here again. I'm going to live inside of the person now. I'm going to take up residency inside of their soul. I'm going to live in them and give them power to overcome their temptations, but not only that. I'm going to give them the ability to have true joy and everlasting life. I mean, isn't this, I know I talk about it all the time, I know it, so you might bring it up to me, that's okay. I just keep coming back to John chapter 4, because to me it's one of the most beautiful examples in the Bible of what a changed life looks like. Because here's this woman, and she is a Samaritan, and she has a husband, and their problems are pretty bad, and she gets rid of that one. But the problem is still there, she's still empty inside, she has to fill it. She has to fill that void that's inside of her. And so she goes and she gets another husband. This one's much better than the last one, boy. Absolutely. I know he will. He doesn't have the same problem that that one had. This one isn't angry, right? No, but there's other sins that he has that rub her the wrong way. She comes to find out, actually, oh, the grass isn't greener on the other side. What was I doing? She gets rid of that one and she finds... Finally, her knight in shining armor comes riding into the town, this very kind and sweet and handsome man. And, oh, surely this one is the one who can fill the void that's inside of me and fill the house and finally give me satisfaction in my life. Surely this one will. And she marries that guy. And enough time goes by and nope. That's the story of Hollywood today, you know. Until Jesus comes along one day and he says to her, would you give me some water? And she, she says, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. Why would you ask me for water? And Jesus said to her, if you knew who it was who was asking you, you would ask him and he would give you living water welling up to eternal life. The water I give, you won't be thirsty anymore. If we have the water that Jesus gives, we won't be thirsty anymore. And she says, give me this kind of water so that I don't have to keep coming here in the middle of the afternoon because all the ladies of the town are avoiding me, all right, because I'm a husband stealer. I'm a home wrecker. They all know that. <clears throat> Why don't you give me this water? And Jesus says to her, go call your husband. I don't have a husband. That's right. He says, you've had five husbands. 
And the man you're living with now, he's not your husband yet. You see what he's doing there? Exposing this thing. Exposing what she's actually doing. Trying to fill the void in her heart with everything other than Christ. But then her true husband really showed up that day. The only person in the whole world who has the actual power to fulfill, to give us what we really need, to quench our thirst, the deepest, innermost thirst that anyone here has. Christ is the only one who has that ability. He's the only one who can live inside of us and change us, change our heart, change us from the inside out, give us a new desire and a new direction in our life. It's only Jesus. I can only preach Jesus from this pulpit. He's the only answer for our deepest needs and our deepest problems. It's only Jesus. Now, I don't apply Jesus all the time perfectly to my own situation. I need to. I need to repent and trust and remember Christ lives in me because I still have the flesh. I still wrestle with the flesh. I still wrestle with my own fleshly desires. And that's true for every single person. That's true for every person. But I know this. Christ lives in me. He does. And he eventually draws me back to himself and quenches my thirst. And it doesn't have to be, you know, drugs that a person is otherwise addicted to. It can be things like shopping or things like Facebook or things like, uh, you know, even volunteering. And you feel much better about yourself by doing this thing, this volunteering thing. And that becomes the idol. That becomes the thing that makes you right and good. And but no, 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 no. All of those things don't matter. Christ is what matters. Does Christ live within you? Has Christ taken up residency inside of your soul? That's what you need. That's what I need. The people who have the Holy Spirit have a protector. One who comes in and fills the house and guards against all others who would be squatters in our souls. You see, Jesus refers to this in Matthew 12, 29, where he talks about binding the strong man. Jesus is the only fulfillment of our deepest needs. Uh, St. Augustine, the Bishop of Hippo, writing in 397 A.D., so writes this, Thou hast made us for thyself, and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in thee. See, Augustine understood this principle. It's the same today. He's writing 397 A.D., that's only 1,600 years ago, but people are still the same right now. We have the same desires and the same needs. He understood human nature. He understands our depravity and the tendency of the human heart to fill itself with all kinds of idols. But we were made for Christ. All things were made through Him and for Him. He is the good and true object of our worship. If Jesus is in the center of our lives, then we are overcomers through Him who died on the cross for our sins and rose from the dead. What is the mission statement of this church? We exist to help people make Jesus the center of their lives. That's what our passage is really talking about is for what's needed. That's what's needed. For Jesus to be in the center of our lives. Then we can say with Paul, I'm crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. You see that? He says, Christ lives in me. My house is not empty. My house, my house, is not just waiting for the next demonic temptation to come. My house is not, I'm not trying to fill it with something else anymore. Because Christ lives in me. He takes up residency in me. And if he lives in me, I don't need to let anybody else in. I'm not going to. He's going to fight them off. He's going to defend the house because this house belongs to him now. He purchased the house, you understand? He purchased this house with his own blood. 
He sheds his blood on the cross as the payment for this house so that he could buy it and that he could live in it. And he defends it. And he gives life to it. And he raises it from the dead. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we need you. We need you to come in and live inside of us. You're the one that can give us hope. We really want to understand what the gospel means. It's not simply about cleaning up our life. You do actually clean up so many things in our lives. That actually does happen as a result of living in Christ and Christ living in me. It does happen. But Lord, the purpose of you coming is to save us, to change us, to draw us to yourself, to make us holy people, to make us alive to you. Lord, I pray that we would have a firm grasp on this. We would really understand it. We would really understand what you are about, what Christianity is about, what coming to church is really about. It's all about you. Be with this church now, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, I think it's... Um, Appropriate then that we would uh, share communion. Jesus said, This is the new covenant of my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Um, that's what we are actually doing when we take communion is that we are proclaiming, we're, we're making an actual proclamation. See, not everyone gets up in a pulpit and proclaims the gospel, all right? But everyone who takes communion actually makes a proclamation. And the proclamation that you make, let me just tell you, because this will determine whether you should take the communion or not, all right? The proclamation that you're making when you take communion is this. I'm a rotten sinner Absolutely, I need Jesus Christ to live in me. I need his flesh and his blood. I need what he did for me on the cross. I'm acknowledging now that I'm absolutely, completely desperate outside of Jesus Christ. I need Jesus to live in me. I'm taking this communion as an acknowledgement, as a proclamation that I am lost outside of him. That he is the only way. That he is the only one who can come inside and dwell inside of my soul and give me life. If you don't believe that, then don't take the communion. All right? Why would you take it then? Don't take that. Paul even gives a warning and he says that people who take it in that kind of a way, in a bad way, and those people are in some danger by doing so. God actually looks at what we're about to do in a serious way. It's a serious thing. It's not, um, here's a little cracker, here's a little juice, whatever. That's not what communion is. It's a public proclamation of my union with Christ and Christ's union with me and living inside of me and I live inside of Him. That's what it is. And not only that, it's a proclamation and a declaration that I see that I'm absolutely no better than any other person in this room. That I'm in just as much need of His grace and His blood and His body broken for me as any of you are. I'm in just as much need. When you take the communion and you see the person next to you taking communion, that actually gives us communion. You see, it gives us community. Because I know, oh, you're a wretched sinner too. I love you, brother. That's why we take it together. That's why we wait together. We take it together. As we take the communion together, and you know, it's a beautiful thing. When I look and I see all of you looking down like this, I see all of you taking the communion. 
I say, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. They're in the same position as I am. Absolute, utter desperation in need of Christ. Let's think about that. As we take the cup and hold it, and we'll take it all together after they sing the song, let's think about it actually as we're about to take it. Remember actually what we're doing. This is a real acknowledgement that we are making a proclamation of Christ's death, His necessary death on the cross in order to forgive me of my sins and to forgive you of your sins and to give us everlasting life in the new covenant. I bet you never thought, maybe you did, of communion as a proclamation. You're actually making a proclamation when you take it. Okay, second sermon is done. We'll take it together after the song.